The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. And he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Amen. you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome. I'm a visitor. Any other visitors? <laughs> My name is Father P.J. Woodall, and Todd's uh, away. Father Todd's away beginning vacation. I think he's up for a family wedding somewhere today, if I, if I recall, but I'm delighted to be with you. Look who's sitting up here. Father Steve. <laughs> Last Sunday, uh, coming back from church where we worship, I was listening to Prairie Home Companion. You know that one with Garrison Keeler and all that. And he was going on and on about what sermons should be like in the summertime. <laughs> he said, no deep theological stuff, people aren't there. He said you should have a beginning and an end and they should be really close together. <laughs> so that's, that's what I'm gonna try to do. Um, we live in a time where we are absolutely bombarded with information. In the electronic age, there are talking heads and internet voices and all this stuff all the time. So whatever consideration is before us, we've got all this stuff going on. Much of it is helpful. Perhaps most of it, I would say, is not. How do we figure it out? How do we discern what to do with all this that's coming to us? Well, this is not a new thing. These lessons today are about that very same thing. Jesus good old James and John, this is his inner circle. James and John, I've got all these voices going on about what to do if somebody slights this Jesus friend of theirs. And they start to do it. Hey, you want us to call fire down from heaven? That guy said something. I don't like that. Jesus said, no. You still got it wrong, boy. It's time to get better more discerning in the way you think about all this information, all these things you've been taught, and what it's meant to be a person of faith. And then this reading from, uh, our second reading from Galatians, is really what it's all about. This is really what this is all about. This is Paul, he's writing to this church in Galatia, and they don't seem to understand what to do with all that they've been taught and all this information that they have. 
And Paul writes this letter differently. You may, know, you may know Paul, and you may know his writings and how he often begins his letters of all these greetings and thanking people and how happy he is to be able to address them and how proud he is of all the work that they're doing and how wonderful his visit was with them on one of his other journeys and so forth and so on. Well, with this one, he does not do that. You should go read this. This is a book for our time, a letter for our time. He starts off this one by saying, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And he goes on and on and on into what the issues are of that time. And at the heart of it, it's about that faith alone is really what it's all about. You've got to rely on your faith. And keep in mind that faith is about trusting God. When we lose faith, we have lost our trust in God. Meaning, we might say to God, well, God, you know, you just don't understand this situation down here. We, we, I know you say this in the Bible, but, you know, we've got to do this. Well, God weeps. God shakes God's head when we're in that sort of a situation. So, what is it that we need to try to be sure that we can stay with God? God in truth. How can we know? I mean, we have all this stuff coming at us. A lot of it on whatever issue of the day you might want to choose. I mean, it sounds plausible. Some of it's reasonable. It's logically thought out. Facts and figures are thrown out. What do we do with all of it? How do we, as people of faith, deal with that? Well, that's what these lessons are about. They're about trying to really know God's truth. And how do we do that? How do we know God's truth? Well, I'm one that believes that truth is not an answer to a puzzle. That truth is not a concept. But that truth is God. Jesus said it. I am the truth. Remember? The way and the light, all those I am statements. Which means truth is of God. And if we are to be in truth, we are to be of God. Of course, we are made in that image. So the innate capability to be in that truth and to know something about God's heart, God's mind, God's ways, God's thoughts is a possibility for us. We often don't get it, just like Jesus' inner circle, just like the people of Galatia. We often don't get it. So how in the world can we do it? Well, I think we've got to trust God. We've got to have the faith, that is, to walk with God, to be able to do that. So how do we attune our Spirits to even know what it is that God might say to us. I'm a retired guy now two years. My wife Lorraine is back here somewhere. There she is. We moved to Stewart a couple of years ago. And now I have a chance to read some things other than theology and all that stuff. And so uh, I was serving before we retired in Carl Gables, Florida, and there was a guy down there by the name of James Gripando. Any of you mystery readers out there? Uh, yeah, J James Grupondo is, is a best-selling New York Times, um, you know, best-seller list all the time with book after book after book. And he was a parishioner. And I said to Jim, you know, Jim, I, I, I don't want to offend you, but I just don't read that kind of stuff. And, but I did after I retired. And he, he hooked me. It was pretty good stuff. It's, it's, it's crime and uh, police work and mystery and suspense and all that tied in. And recently, I picked up another one in the same genre by Robert Crace, 
he's um, a similar kind of writer. But that's not what I want to say about this book. This is a book where one of the chief characters is a dog. <laughs> and this dog is um, first in the military in Af Afghanistan and then as a police dog. And he's involved with um, munitions sniffing and with being able to have the senses to tell the soldiers and the police people far more than they can figure out with their human limitations. He's got some senses that we humans don't have. We humans have senses that God's given us that we don't use. All right, I want to read you a couple of paragraphs about the sense of smell that this dog has. It's a German Shepherd, so he's got this long snout, and biologically that long snout allows great things to happen in discrimination and, and discernment of what's going on with the smells. Listen to some of this. The dog's name is Maggie, and her, her handler in the military is Pete. At Pete's command, Maggie trotted to the end of her leash, which was tethered to a metal D-ring on Pete's harness. She knew exactly what Pete expected because Pete had trained her, and they had performed the same mission hundreds of times. They were in Afghanistan. Their job was to walk along the road 20 meters ahead of the Marines to find the IED, those improvised explosive devices. They went first, and their lives and the lives of the Marines behind depended on Maggie's nose. Maggie swung her head from side to side, checking the high scents first, then dipped her head to taste the smells close to the ground. The humans behind her might be able to identify five or six distinct smells if they concentrated. But Maggie's long shepherd nose gave her an olfactory picture of the world no human could comprehend. She smelled the dust beneath their feet and the goats that had been herded along the road a few hours earlier and two young male goat herds who led them. Maggie smelled the infection that one of the goats carried and knew that two of the female goats were in heat. She smelled Pete's fresh new sweat and the old sweat dried into his gear, his breath, the perfumed letter he kept in his trousers and the green ball hidden beneath his flat. That's a green tennis ball that she loved to chase. She smelled the CLP he used to clean his rifle and the residual gunpowder that clung to his weapon like a fine dust of death. She smelled the small grove of palms not far from the road and the trace scent of the wild dogs that had slept beneath the palms during the night and defecated and urinated before moving on. Maggie hated the wild dogs. She spent a moment testing the air to see if they were still in the area, decided they were gone, that ignored their scent, concentrated on searching for the scents Pete wanted her to find. All right, there's an image of how we are to search for the sense that God wants us to find. And knowing that deep within us, in the image of God, that we are someone in distress there. Mm, excuse me. You need to talk and you continue to listen and hold Dick in your heart, okay? Because it's that strength that we have together, the only way. That's what this lesson's about. It's that strength that we have together with God. And we don't have connection necessarily always to that which God has given us. Like Maggie, this dog, this shepherd. Maggie's got these senses that are incredible. So do we. So do we. So that when we are assaulted by all this information, that we have a way to go.
go into that deep place within the heart of God and figure out what truth is, who truth is, and what to do with it. Now, I tell you, there's a problem. We're not unlike Jesus' disciples, and we're not unlike those people of Galatia. We get it wrong. We get it wrong. We don't seem to know how deeply God's love goes. So we make our boundaries and our definitions of who God might love and who God might not love and what God might do in this situation to react, and surely God will understand. We've got somehow to be in touch, more in touch with that which is clearly of God and not simply of our own humanness because our own humanness has that failing. And I told you the end would be pretty close to the beginning, so I'm going to end. But I'm going to end with one more incredible kind of little story, National Geographic. I'm reading, getting a chance to read those now, and the Smithsonian Magazine. You know, they've been piling up in my house forever. Now I can pick them up. Well, there's a little uh, one-page article in here. Those of you who get this may have read it. It's called Batman. Anybody read that? Anyway, it's about a man who's 47 years old. When he was 18 months old, I think it was, 13 months old as an infant, he had retinal cancer. Retina, the eyes. Both of his eyes were removed at 13 months old. He's now is 47, and he gets around in this world somewhat in the same way that bats do with echolocation, what they call echolocation. There was bats send out these, emit these uh, kind of radar things, and, the, and it comes back to them, and, they, and they're able to know what to do with it. This man is doing the same thing. Listen to this. Sound waves are produced by tongue clicks. So he goes along twice a second, it is said, making some kind of ticking sound with his tongue. These waves bounce off surfaces all around, return to his ears as faint echoes. My brain, he says, processes the echoes into dynamic images. It's like having a conversation with the environment. Each click is like a camera flash. I construct a three-dimensional image of my surroundings for hundreds of feet in every direction. Up close, I can detect a pole an inch thick. At 15 feet, I recognize cars and bushes. Houses come into focus at 150 feet, simply by clicking, and then the sound coming back. He was asked the question, what's it like riding a bicycle? Which he does with echo location. His response was, it's thrilling, so you can imagine but requires, his point, very focused and sustained concentration on the acoustics of the environment. It requires very focused and sustained concentration. That's what our spirit has got to do, to really hear and know God's truth and depth of love. Otherwise, we're not going to get it. Otherwise, we put limits on God's love. Otherwise, we think, oh, what's a little disagreement and all this kind of stuff as we fight and fight and fight personally, communally, internationally, on and on and on while God weeps. So that's just one little example. What it means is that somehow We've got to be attuned truly to God. Now, it is summertime. It is a time that we can maybe kick back a little bit, and maybe have some space and time to sit with God, the quietness of our own self, wonder about such things, listen for such things, sniff the air for such things, just like Maggie the dog, to sniff see what's out there and to make a discernment. Maggie could smell that green tennis ball. Can we smell 
that which is of God. Can it come to us? Yes, because we have the image of God in us. Very important lessons today. Again, so critically important that Jesus chastises his inner circle and that Paul gets right in their face. And that is, it's not of love, it's not of God. If it's not a pure, true love, it's not of God. So I'm going to rest with that in my prayers, and I hope you will. Take these lessons home and just sit with them a bit and see what God brings to you. Amen.